do critics know what a good movie is? Do audiences know what a good movie is? Critics, the people who make it, no one knows anything. Nobody knows. <laughs> Trying to make a good movie or a great movie is an exercise in catching lightning in a fucking bottle. I love that you said that because that's so true. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Back to the Podcast. We are your hosts, Justin Neal, and I'm Chris Lawler. We just want to thank everyone out there for listening and watching. Please hit that like and subscribe button. It really helps out a lot more than you think. Also join the conversation on Facebook and Back to the Podcast discussion. On today's show, Justin and I will be chatting it up about what we saw this week, what's happening around Hollywood, and take a stab at some more trivia. Justin, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing better than I was last week, that's for sure. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, I know last week was kind of a downer, and I'm still sad, but doing better and you know, time heals the wound, which I know at this point. How have you been? It wasn't a great week for things that Chris watched. Was it a good week for things Justin watched? It sounds like you missed uh, the target a couple of times. Yeah, okay. Or they did. Yeah, I, th probably they did. I mean, it's okay. Maybe this is, I'm going to get a lot of flack for kind of dogging on it, but one of the highest grossing movies of the year so far, I didn't enjoy like even a little bit, but that was the Super Mario Brothers. It finally came out on streaming. I sat down and watched it. And I was like, wow, the plot is like razor thin. There's not much going on. It was just like, hey, let's get to the next set piece. Hey, by the way, we have to get to the next set piece. Hey, we've got to introduce the next character and get to the next set piece. And there was just no substance. And that's when I texted you and I was like, I guess this movie really was just made for five-year-olds. It is. I'm just a little disappointed. Whereas I sat next to a six-year-old when we watched it. Yeah. It was like, this is fantastic. We don't waste any time explaining anything. Shit explodes and they jump and they zoom and and they whiz and pow yeah. and the kids adored it. You are not the target audience, my friend. I am sorry. I get that, but I was like, comparing it to Wreck-It Ralph, right? I love Wreck-It Ralph. I think that is an amazing animated film. I haven't seen that one. Didn't John C. Riley do the voice? John C. Riley? Yes, and Sarah, so that is so disappointing. That I haven't seen it. How have you not seen Wreck-It Ralph, man? I haven't gotten around to it. That's a shame, dude. Uh, you're kind of missing out. That's a good one. It's on the list. But like, Why don't you have two little kids and then find the time to watch everything you want? Yeah, you're gonna just keep using them as an excuse to not watch children's movies. But yeah, no, Wreck-It Ralph, obviously kind of in a similar genre. Sure. Anime film about video games yeah yeah even the live action sonic movie i thought was actually better than that they like that one too but see that one because jim carrey's doing his wild wild over the top performance in there even the second one was fun and i'm not a huge sonic fan i grew up on mario a five-year-old me probably would have ate that movie up yeah the adult in me was like wow they really didn't even like try and it's okay i learned that movie wasn't for me. And now there's a whole new generation of kids that love Mario. When I was at the library, I was looking up some books. The movie had just come out and some little kid was walking past me going, Wahoo! 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 over and over again and I was like yeah I guess that's who it's for and I'm glad that there's a whole new generation of kids that are gonna love Mario Mario is gonna be one of those iconic characters that goes on forever and that's great but but it was not for you not for me you know I <laughs> kind of was like wow the old live action movie almost had more plot than this did zing whatever I'm reading too much into you are but once again dude this is where I go back to the movies that we grew up on and they had darker themes and more story than what I'm seeing now for kids but they also had crap that too. I don't know. They didn't treat us like children when they made children movies is how I'm really thinking about it. And some would say not for the good. I don't know, man. <laughs> Goonies is still one of our all-time faves. Those kids oh, are sure. cussing up a storm in that movie. Absolutely. There are murderers chasing them. I just mean like, what do we show our children and what are we trying to reinforce, I suppose. I'm with that, but the, in the first few moments of Goonies, the guy hangs himself in a jail cell. Yeah, I know. And that's a kid's movie. I shouldn't be this upset about it, but I am. So I watched a movie that... <laughs> that I think is hilarious. What is it? Michael Bay's dark comedy Pain and Gain with Wahlberg okay. and Dwayne Johnson. I have seen that. And Anthony Mackie. I didn't hate that movie. I like super dark comedy. I only saw that once. I, I don't think I necessarily found it as funny as you did, but I definitely remember not hating it. I like the idea, and this is one of the things I like about dark comedy, when you get charismatic people like Wahlberg, Okay, he's got charisma, he's a movie star, of course he does. Yeah. But when they're doing obviously dumb things, but they play it like, 
no, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Let's just keep going. <laughs> that to me is so funny. People like that are just digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think Wahlberg <laughs> is good at doing that. And Dwayne Johnson's just kind of hapless like, I guess so. Yeah. And Wahlberg's like, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Get with the program. And you're just sitting there going, this is a horrible idea. All of this is bad. None of this is going to work. You're all idiots. This is fantastic. Because to me, that is so funny. Funny, yeah, yeah, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. The Three Stooges, but on steroids. And making horrible, horrible, like sociopathic decisions. I don't remember much of that movie. I just remember they were like full of drugs and like full of muscles. They're all juiced up. They're bodybuilders. We're going to make our lives better. Yeah. Come on. That's right up your alley, isn't it? It's a hard, R dark comedy. Did you watch anything else? Something else. Please recommend something good that I can go and watch for myself. Something that was silly and fun, which is right up your alley, is Renfield. Oh, okay. With Nicholas Holt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, Nick Cage. Right, right. It's a codependent relationship. Okay. Dracula abuses him and then says, but I'm the only one who loves you and come back. Oh, uh, okay. So he starts a, like, codependent anonymous sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about it as a toxic relationship, except he's referring to Dracula. Right on. It was funnier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. There's a lot of therapy humor in it. Okay. I have never been to, like, codependence anonymous, but I've been to therapy before, and it is a lot like that. Yeah, right, 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 right. Same time, people different issues. It was gorier than I thought it was gonna be. That's awesome. It's bloody as fuck. Gory, funny, comedy. It stars Nick Holt. I love Nick Holt. We were just watching Mad Max again this week, and of course, he's amazing in that one. Love Mad Max. Nick Cage's whole comeback thing. That's exciting to hear another good one. I mean, it sounds like he's been knocking out some home runs. It starts off, he gets all fucked up, and then he has to, you know, regenerate. And so Nicholas Holt has to bring him victims and all that shit. Mm -hmm. It isn't just like he's all like burned to a crisp and then bites someone and suddenly he's fine again. It's like an interview with the vampire. You know, it takes some time to recuperate from such things. And so Nicholas Holt's taking care of him, but they did a lot of like really gruesome makeup. Fun. Kind of makeup you look at it and you go, ooh, that looks slimy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's that wet. I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know you do. Would you watch it on though? Netflix? I rented it on Amazon, I believe. Cool, right on. It's hard to tell now. I know, right? Who knows what I watched it on? I watched it on the fucking television. Shows up. But it actually (laughs) seemed like it was right up your alley. Awesome. So check it out. Renfield. Okay, great. I'm glad you brought it up because I know that that is something I added to the list this week. It sounds like you had a better week than I did when it comes to film. You'll like it for sure. Although I did get to watch Mad Max, which is always one of my favorites. And you know, that comfort food again. The movie's hardcore. Talking about streaming and you know how we were so reliant on streaming services and then can't even remember what we watched on what platform, right? Like, are you happy with your streaming services? Because I read an article yesterday that they're hiking up prices 27% on Disney Plus and Hulu's package. And it just feels like it's not justified because the content really hasn't been there, man. I mean, like, do you have a love-hate relationship with your streaming services like I do? Or are you just happy that there's content at your fingertips? I have a love-hate relationship with technology in general. Okay. (laughs) I loved VHS. I hated it at the same time because it was a shitty quality and I love DVD but I hated it at the same time because it was still a shitty quality but it was better than VHS. Yeah. It all evolves and it all comes with it so I can't say that I'm happy with it but I don't know what would make me happy with it. Like what would make you happy? Would Do you just want one streaming service? Do you want them all to be bought by one company like a monopoly and that's where we get any TV or movie? Is that what you want? Mm. Like what do you do then? What's the solution? I don't know what the answer is. I'm still a big fan of physical media. I really am. When the internet goes out, it's all gone. So I'm very happy that I have, still have a DVD player and could just go throw in a TV show, movies, and stuff like that. I have a whole collection of things to go and watch when the internet's not working. But then the flip side of that is you could make the ecological argument that disc media is incredibly wasteful and hazardous to the environment yeah. in getting the things to make it but, and but, making it. And then all the trash. Do you know how many but, scratched but, but, discs but, are in the ocean? But, 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 I'm with that, but, but, my bigger problem is the fact that I can't find 
the media that I want to find anymore because of copyright issues. People haven't renewed licenses and stuff. That's always been a problem. But more media has disappeared and it's harder to even find some more hardcore, deeper dives digitally without, you know, ripping them and going on a torrent, you know, rampage and stuff like that. No. What? You don't think so? I think that's a weak. You think you can just go to Amazon and find anything you want? No, it just takes a little more effort, but it was always that way. Mm. When I worked at Media Play, that first job in the video department, yeah. people would come in all we had was this big fucking book and it had every movie i remember that book actor and actress and director that's ever been fucking yeah, made. yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a toe yeah some weird smelly people would come in and they were trying <laughs> to deep dive on these old things and they would have to find some warehouse somewhere in ohio that's got a copy of something that's out of print and has been out of print for 30 fucking years so i would argue and say that actually you're more likely to find something online now than ever ever before okay now is that a good thing because you get lost in the ocean you know you're what I mean? right there are hard things to find but i feel like with every iteration of new media even with dvds going back to vhs we lose a little bit more because more and more gets lost to the archives more and more doesn't get renewed with licenses okay and more and more it's like why would i mass produce that on vhs when it wasn't popular on beta why would i mass produce that on dvd when it didn't work well on vhs right like i'm gonna bring up a very obscure movie but dogma comes to mind right right? Dogma, I cannot find right now. A Kevin Smith movie is obscure. It is. I know. Just hear me out though. For you to stream maybe, but not for you to buy. No, no, no. It's hard to buy because Harvey Weinstein oh, needs money fucking Weinstein. for his legal thing. So he's holding onto the rights of some of these things really? that need to be reprinted and remass produced. Oh, that son of a bitch. So I cannot find Dogma for less than 200 bucks on Blu-ray. Wow. Like, it's one of those things that has now fallen off the wayside and you can't stream it. Just trust me, I'm going somewhere with this, but that's the story right now with Dogma. Yeah, yeah. I know it's some random title and it's not the biggest thing in the world, but... I used to have a Dogma a sticker on my car in high school. I haven't been able to show that movie to my wife in our entire relationship because of the obscurity of that movie. It makes me hate myself when I could have bought that movie mm -hmm. and had that physical copy with me. I did have a copy and got stolen. Oh, that's nice. You're right though. If I went down a rabbit hole online, I probably could find some ripped version of it. No, but there's still video stores. In Portland, there's a place locally owned sort of video store. Those are the kind of places that you can go and find deep cuts. Yeah. They know where to look to get legit copies of things. So like find the video nerds. I'm with that. And I used to have a local store. I don't have one here where I live now, but I used to have a like a play it again video store kind of thing that we used to go to. Yeah. I love that place. Had the DVDs, the vinyl records, video games, movies, everything. Let's say if you want to find a legit copy of Dogma, go to a used place. I'm with that. You've probably I, I, got eight copies of the DVD on the wall. I'm hearing you. What we're talking about, though, is the fact <laughs> that things are going digital and it's harder yeah. and harder to find the physical stuff. And yeah. now that things have gone digital, more and more movies are just falling by the wayside and not being renewed with their copyrights, renewed with their yeah. license. And hey, like, let's reshow this to a new generation. And that brings me back to Disney+. Plus. I don't think there's anything really good about what they've been doing with the new properties they've been bringing on. Marvel has definitely been seeing a slide. Because well, Marvel was always set up just to kind of get through Infinity War, really. They did have a huge idea of what they wanted to do. Kind of completed their 10 year just saying. cycle and good on them. I get it, that's how I feel too. Like they did their big- Hey, at least we got to the end. Magnum opus. They finished it, it was great. And you get Blue Beetle. Uh, well, that's DC. Like, did you hear about- That's DC. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah, I'm showing my colors there. You nerd. <laughs> yeah, like I give a shit. But what I was thinking about, have you heard the news about Turner Classic Movies, I believe recently? No. Whoever owns Turner, because everything's owned. Okay, let's go back a little bit. A lot of this has to do with what happened with the studios in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So the studios and the Hollywood system used to be, yes, they were run by businessmen, but these were like businessmen who thought of themselves as creatives. They were show business people, mm -hmm. okay? But then in the like 60s and then in the 70s, the owners all got old and they were rich. And so they just started selling the studios off because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. And who bought it were businesses like Sony, yeah. which I like Sony consumer electronic products. I have no problem with that. But now they own a movie studio yeah. and Sony is not run by creatives no. or people who fancy themselves creatives. They're run by accountants, yeah. which makes sense on some level 
for that, but show business is different. And so now it's all metrics yeah. and data. And that's why you get the IP things because no one wants to fund anything that they don't already know has an audience. And that's how we've been getting all of this stuff. Okay, so Barbie, right? Grossed a billion dollars, great movie. A lot of people really like it, super popular. What a great summer blockbuster we had, right? But then the Meg 2 came out. No one asked for it, no one was looking for it, if you will. It's just a fuel for a giant monster to eat some people and have some silly fun, right? That movie grossed a billion dollars worldwide. Had a humongous opening weekend. What? With a 0% rating on Rotten Tomato. Think back just a few episodes ago where we were talking about our guilty pleasures. Those are not necessarily popular movies, but we like them. So that's the same thing that's happening with the Meg too, right? They were like, we got lucky on the first one. Let's give more of what the audience wants. And so critics hated it, but people that love big monster movies with just dumb humans getting eaten up, ate that movie up. That's what they want. They went to the box office, they paid their money. And apparently those do really good overseas. So it did like 43 million, I think, stateside, and then finished that billion climb. In China. <laughs> yeah. So what makes a good movie? It, once again, like you said, like critics probably don't even know. I started out today, right? I compared Mario Brothers to Wreck-It Ralph because I was like, these are animated movies that talk about video games. There's gotta be some similarities. Hopefully they do some adult humor so that I can enjoy it as an adult as well. And then they didn't, right? I took in my you know, mindset to that film of Super Mario Brothers and shit all over it. But a six year old's gonna look at me and think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest movie he's ever seen in his life. He's gonna look at you and say, you're old. Yeah, exactly. You're a grumpy old curmudgeon. You don't like things at all. <laughs> what makes a good movie? Like you said, capturing a lightning in a bottle. What is lightning in a bottle then, right? Is it undefined? Do we not know? Do we still not know? Well, and the problem is there's a couple of different businesses going on when we talk about movies. So first you've got what I would think of like grocery store novels, mm -hmm. like airplane novels, you know? Oh, right, right. Books. Someone wrote it. It's a fine story. You read it. You put it down. It's a thing. Some movies are like that. It's work. You're telling a story. It follows a formula and you move on. And then other people are trying to write, you know, the great novel. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we like to talk about. Most of the time, I like movies you know, that follow the auteur theory of a writer director because it's someone's like statement. It's not made by committee. Yeah. We're going to climb that fucking mountain. Come on! Yeah, like Tarantino, right? Exactly. That's, I'm assuming, who you're really thinking of. Christopher Nolan. Nolan, right. Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm -hmm. Greta Gerwig now, which is fantastic. Right. Jordan Peele's another one mm. that just has recently showed up. Good call. And that's what you're trying to catch with lightning in a bottle, because it's not just you. It's a bunch of people. A lot of what makes a movie great is also the environment in which it's made, some good, some bad. Some are forged in the hellfire, <laughs> yeah. and then you get something grand out of it, like Apocalypse Now or Blade Runner. Oh. And then others were like, right. that was a lot of fun, and we had a blast, and oh my god. I think of like comedies like Step Brothers. There you go. Like, I think of something where it's like... Wet Hot American Summer. Right, where it's like, we got together, we improvised almost all the dialogue, we made each yeah. other laugh, and at the end of six weeks, we had a film. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even think about making the the movie you know that sounds like fun right yeah exactly so what even makes a good movie right it's all subjective mm -hmm. i try to keep that in context but i found over the years that most people don't and they're like i didn't like that movie it sucked yeah and that's just it and they move on with their life right they don't think about you know all the time spent you know going into making it or what they were trying to do yeah they just want a grocery store novel yeah but going back to turner classic movies oh yeah 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 turner classic movies was going to be sold by the corporation that owns it now shut down the shop and no longer have Turner Classic Movies and something was going to happen to all of those archives and so Spielberg and Paul Thomas Anderson and one of the other it was one of the other like film proponents big directors yeah yeah yeah, yeah who like you know took it as a mission to save Turner Classic Movies because of what you're talking about so that we have access to these things in some form yeah and they like pulled out all their big guns and their influence and their clout and kept it I don't I didn't I haven't looked up recently what the situation was but the last time I heard was that it wasn't going to be closed in the way that was originally intended by the corporation. So they've kind of kept it alive. That's good though. Otherwise the gatekeepers are gonna be who you're talking about, subscription providers. Yeah. Those are the 
gatekeepers of what gets shown. That's really what you're talking about. They're the gatekeepers, exactly. And I pay them monthly and then they decide what I get to watch. Yeah. And it's all based off of algorithm and stuff like that nowadays. And what they promote too. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm happy because it gives me an opportunity to discover new things. More independent filmmakers because big budget Hollywood movies have kind of killed like the lower independent and maybe like comedies. IFC. The IFC, but like period pieces mm -hmm. and stuff like that as well, right? Period dramas. We don't get as much of that. Like they're all on Netflix now as TV shows. They're not movies. Regular day blokes like you and me that are like, I have a script. You can actually go pitch it to these places. I am. So there's some positive to it, but as a consumer, I'm tired of the price hikes. There's a reason why those writers are on strike. There's a reason why those actors are on strike right now. They're not getting paid what they should be. These big time big wigs are still taking home huge bonuses and we're the ones paying for it all. The actors are suffering. The writers are suffering. We're the ones paying for it. The creators are suffering. And who's making the money is Bob Iger and all these CEOs and executives. And now they're announcing a price hike. And it's like, great, give me the content, pay the actors what they're due. Let's get back to having creative fun and making stuff that people want to watch. The only way that's going to happen is if people unplug. In mass, people have to cancel subscription. That's the only thing. We have to join the strike. Join the strike? Yeah, join the strike from our side and just be like, I'm not gonna pay your subscription fees until you pay people what they're owed and start giving me the content that I wanna see and stop being like, well, the algorithm says you wanna see this, so I'm gonna just give you this. And it's like, get back to just being creative, man. Who knows what's gonna strike, right? Lightning in a bottle, as we were just talking about. Who knows what's gonna work? Hashtag join the strike. There we go. Join the strike. Damn the man. Hack the planet. Save the empire, right? That's right. This is not a place for us to be on a platform and rah, rah, rah. It is today. Yeah, it is today, so. I like people who tell stories. Ultimately, we love stories. That's what we love. We love stories. Whether it comes in a video game, uh, yeah. or if it comes in a book, or if it comes in a movie, that's what we love. We wanna be a part of something that the adventure is a little unrealistic because right? reality can be hard yeah. and unfulfilling. Escapism is great. And not only that, we want to create these things. A lot of these people who are trying to create things are just like us. And they have this will and passion and desire to tell stories right. because they want to share in the collective. A vision. And that makes them feel good because that's what would make me feel good is doing something that drew people together in a cinema and all laughed or cried or whatever emotion right. that we wanted to make them feel. That's the point. That's what the magic of cinema is. Being transported someplace else and yep. feeling that emotion. And that comes from people. That comes from the people who make it. That comes from the people who watch it. It's the emotion yeah. and it's not done by CEOs who are businessmen. Look, I get it. It's a business. It is a business. Money, economy. Yep. We get it, but. I can't get the sequel if you don't make money on the first movie. I do understand that as well, but make a good first movie then. Justify the sequels. So anyway, I am for the people who make this. I want to be one of those people to make movies for people. Yeah. That's what I love. I love storytelling. I know you love storytelling. I love storytelling. But what makes a good movie? Critics don't know. Critics just wish they could make stuff. Yeah. They are bitter people. <laughs> you know, it's hard not to critique things. It's because we wanted them to be the movie we wanted. You want it to be great. Right? I like, I want it to be great. Like, there, it, it's, it's not hard. like. It's hard. It's hard to make great. You know, it's just like when a game comes out, there's a lot of work. There's years of work that can go into making a game, even a movie, right? And then it comes out, and I get two hours to judge that project. I only get that small window, the finished project. I don't, I, I'm not there with these people that poured their hearts and passion. And, you know, sometimes when you're making something, you're kind of making it with blinders on and I'm seeing things with an open mind sometimes. So it's personal and it's selfish, but at the same time, there is a reason why some movies make this much money. And then there's movies like the Meg too, that get no praise and nothing, but still make a bunch of money. Which means they'll keep making those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let us know in the comments below, what kind of movies do you like to go and see? Yeah. What are the things that draw you out to the theaters okay. and stuff like that? But before we go today, let's do this trivia thing. Let's test it out. We've been having fun with this going back and forth. Let's see if we can stump one another with some film trivia. I've got 10 questions here. They're gonna get harder as they go along. So have fun playing along at home. Let's get this started. 60 seconds are up on the uh, clock here. And here we go. Who directed Back to the Future? Robert Zemeckis. In Die Hard, what building is taken over by the terrorists? The Nakatomi building. Which film features a character named Kaiser Soze? The Usual Suspects. Who played the lead role in Rain Man? Trick question. Dustin Hoffman. 
Sure. Name the actor who portrayed Hannibal Lecter. Oh, I guess Tom Cruise. It's his story. Yeah. (laughs) Say that again. Silence of the Lambs. What? Who portrayed Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs? Sir Anthony Hopkins. There you go. Which 1999 film? A 1999 film follows the story of a man who is accidentally left behind when his family goes on vacation. Home Alone. Yeah, there it is. In the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, what is the procedure that Joel undergoes? Memory wipe. Who directed the 2001 fantasy film Pan's Labyrinth? Guillermo del Toro. And No Country for Old Men, what's the term used to describe the weapon Anton Chigurh uses? Pass. Oh, okay. And name the 1988 crime comedy film where two hitmen wear black suits and engage in various misadventures. Pulp Fiction. But that's not 1988. That was wrong. (laughs) And three, two, one. In the film Moon, what actor plays Sam Bell, who is nearing the end of his three-year solitary assignment on a lunar base? I think that's Sam Rockwell. Which 1980s action adventure film produced by Steven Spielberg follows a teenager who accidentally travels back in time? Oh, that, wait. No, he produced? Oh, so Back to the Future. In the movie A Beautiful Mind, the brilliant mathematician John Nass is played by which actor? Oh, pass. What is the title of the 1994 dark fantasy film directed by Neil Jordan, where little Tommy Cruise plays a character named Lestat? Isn't that Labyrinth? No, 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 no. Oh, God, I'm drawing a blank. Pass. I'm drawing a blank. Which oh. which 2013 science fiction film directed by Spike Jones tells the story of a man who falls in love with an intelligent operating system? Artificial intelligence? No, and that was not in that movie. Go on next. In the film Eyes Wide Shut, which real-life couple plays the main characters, Bill Hartford and his, Al- and his wife, Alice? Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. I got one. There we go. Okay, and that's your minute. Oh, man. That was terrible. I feel like you got off way easier on those questions than I did. Oh, yeah? Well, we used the same place to generate it. But that was shameful. I guess I will be shot out of a cannon next week for losing. Hey, you got time to uh, claw your way back? Right on. Well, let's go through those answers real quick for everybody listening at home. So back to yours. Who directed Back to the Future? It was Robert Zemeckis. In Die Hard, what building is taken over by terrorists? That was Nakatomi Plaza. Way to go. Which film features a character named Kaiser Soze? That is the usual suspects. Who played the lead role in Rain Man? It was Dustin Hoffman considered as the leading man in Rain Man. Name the actor who portrayed Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Pretty easy. That is Anthony Hopkins. You even added the sir on there. So another half point for you. Total professional. Which 1999 film follows the story of the man who is uh, is accidentally left behind when his family goes on vacation, home alone. Now, why is it a man who is accidentally left behind? I don't know. And that's what we get for using AI to generate questions. And it was the wrong year. You still got it right. This one, I think you're going to lose a half a point on. In the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, what is the procedure that Joel undergoes? It's called memory erasure. It's a memory wipe. Yeah. Memory erasure. So half, okay. you, yeah. <laughs> Who directed the 2001 fantasy film Pan's Labyrinth? That is Guillermo del Toro. And then in No Country for Old Men, what's the term used to describe the weapon Anton Chigurh uses? Yeah, what's it called? A captive bolt pistol. Okay. And then in the 1988 crime comedy film where two hitmen wear black suits and engage in various misadventures was Midnight Run. Oh, and I said Pulp Fiction, so I got that one wrong. Way off. (laughs) Midnight Run was directed by the guy who directed Me, Joe Black, which I'm a big fan of. Oh, nice. But I've never seen Midnight Run with Robert De Niro and... I've never seen it either. And I've also not seen Me, Joe Black, but it did get added to the list this week. Okay. I don't think you'll like it, so good luck with that one. (laughs) Great. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. <laughs> As I learn you more and more, it's like, no, Mijo Black is not the movie for you. Really? Okay, cool. If you finish it, I would give you a treat. All right. Well, I will come back for a cookie next week then. Okay. How did I do, which was terrible? In the film Moon, what actor plays Sam Bell? You got Sam Rockwell. Which 80s adventure comedy yeah. film produced by Steven Spielberg follows a teenager who accidentally travels rough. back in time? It took you a second, but you got it. Uh, back to the Future, A Beautiful Mind. You threw me a brilliant off. mathematician. Oh, Russell Crowe. What is the title of the 1994 dark fantasy film directed by <laughs> where little Tommy Cruise plays Jesus. a character named Lestat? Hold on, that wait, is, before you say it, it's legend. It's Interview with the Vampire. Oh, why was I thinking of... Moving on. Which 2013 science fiction film directed by Spike Jones tells the story of a man who falls in love with an intelligent operating system is her... Oh, I never saw that With one. With Joaquin. Oh. 
In the film Eyes Wide Shut, which real life couple plays the main character is Bill Hartford and his wife Alice. You got that right. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Well, here's the next one. I didn't get to it, but let's just see if you could get it. Who directed the 2017 coming of age film Lady Bird? Was that Lena Dunham? Greta Gerwig. Oh, man. The it lady of the moment. The it lady of the moment. Yeah. Wow. You threw me way off with that one. All right. Yeah, that was great. I'm glad we got to finish up with that. You kicked my ass once again. So, well, there we go, man. That is another fun episode of Back to the Podcast. Thank you, fantastic listeners for being a part of today's episode. It's incredible how our conversations just take us places to uh, these weird insights and discovery. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, what are you waiting for? Smash it. That way you won't miss any of the cool stuff we dive in together. And hey, don't let the conversation fade out. Your thoughts, comments, and crazy ideas keep this party going. Type away in the comments. Let's stir up some brain waves. All right. Awesome bunch. Let's keep riding this wave. Hit the subscribe, drop a comment, and let's keep this podcast groove alive. Catch you in the next time. I'm back to the podcast. Keep being epic, everybody.